If you found this video, you are planning on overhauling your Atmos 528. Um, this was an Atmos that I acquired about 15 years ago. It wasn't running. Well, it would run for a couple of days and then it would stop working. Um, I recently overhauled this and as you can tell, if you watch the balance, the amplitude is pretty high. It's keeping accurate time. It's been timed at roughly, um, it's running fast by 45 seconds a month. That's pretty good. I like my clocks to run a little bit fast because then it's easier to, to set them. So 500 degree amplitude, really good. Um, that clock behind me was bought on eBay. I just set it up. It ran for about 45 minutes and it stopped. It was described as being in working condition and recently serviced. Now, I got it for a very good price. I knew that was a line of baloney. Everyone on Amazon says that their clocks have recently be serviced and they are running. They are all liars. Unless they can give you a video for about two minutes that shows the balance running like this, and it's not wobbling around where someone went ahead and manipulated it and spun it around with their hand, it's rock steady and it's running. Or maybe they can give you a video of when it was torn apart. Anyone who's gonna service your clock should be able to give you a video or some pictures of everything taken apart. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to, um, so getting back to this clock, that's when we're gonna service. That's a 528 um, dash eight. So um, describe as working, all this other stuff. I knew it was, I got it for a good price. I knew that was all a lie. Um, we're going to overhaul that clock and get it to work as good as these two clocks. Um, we're gonna take everything apart. We're gonna follow, um, we're gonna clean all the parts. There's no reason to take apart the balance if the balance doesn't need to be taken apart. For instance, the suspension spring is in good condition. Most overhaulers don't touch that. Um, hopefully that's the case with this clock. So we're gonna do everything else. We're gonna take the movement apart. We're gonna inspect the bellows. We're gonna measure it to make sure it's um, within specs. We're gonna reassemble. We're gonna oil certain parts with Mobius 9020 and we're going to start our regulating where we start setting a time, see how fast everything is running. For specs to do this work, you're going to need to get the repair notes. You can get this from Time Saver. This will have all the specs. I think this even has a 540 in it, this, this clock. So it'll have everything, I think, from 528 to your 540. Uh, very important. You want to make sure everything is within specs. A nice little step-by-step -step tutorial that you can get on Amazon is the Atmos Clock Repairs Bench Manual. I think it's like 35 bucks. It's worth it. Um, between these two documents, it's, it gives you a very good path forward of how to overhaul your clock. So. Um, just keep in mind, everyone on eBay is a liar unless they can send you videos of everything working properly and they accept a, you know, a return. Maybe it's a week, two weeks. That'd be great. Doesn't work. Send it back. Um, and um, also, I want you to pay attention to photographs. This is a photograph of a clock, a clock that I recently saw a couple days ago on Chrono24. It's a pretty reliable website. You can buy some high-end clocks. This, this one was about $3,000. Again, one owner serviced what's laying at the bottom of the Atmos case, but the pin that retains the bellow spring chain, what's it doing there? It's not supposed to be there. Um, it should be on that little end cap on that spring in the bellow. Then I decide to kind of zoom in on the picture and the chain is gone. The chain broke off. So here they are, they're listing a very expensive clock. And in fact, that clock runs about what I paid for this one. So they're advertising it, it's been serviced. Um, it's working. There is no way it's working without the chain. So um, as we're going through these steps, you're going to learn what to look for and I'm gonna go through all that with you so that you're um, an educated buyer. Now keep in mind, the service we're gonna perform on this clock is gonna run about $750 to $1,000 if you were to pay a professional. There's not many guys who service these clocks for the most part. Clock guys stay the hell away from them. They don't want anything to do with them because they are like watches, but I service watches. I, uh, I can take a, a brand new Swiss movement, strip it, clean it, reassemble it, and I make my own watches. Uh, so this is kind of the same thing. It's really delicate. Uh, so many things can go wrong. If you break one part, let's say um, the, you lift up the case and you snag the minute wheel and you break the fourth wheel, 
stem, 200 bucks for a used part on eBay, if, it's, if you can even find it. So be very careful. If you don't feel comfortable doing this work yourself, spend the money, have somebody do it. Um, contact me, maybe I'll do it for you if the clock is working and you just want it cleaned, I'd be more than happy to do that for you. So um, enjoy the video. Definitely not a clock that's in the best condition, but it's not in bad condition. It's a little crispy. Um, these are the tools. I'm gonna get started with screwdriver set, eight millimeter wrench for the acorn nuts for the bellow, tweezers, a movement holder. You're going to need uh, this device to pull the hands. You can get that from Time Saver, some pliers. And we're going to flip this over and loosen the four screws that hold the case top in place. And of course we're gonna remove this piece of glass before we do anything so it doesn't come falling out. If this was the 528-6 model, you would just take two pins apart from here and lift the whole case up. We are going to remove the bellows. We're gonna take this nut apart here and then there's one up here using an eight millimeter wrench. Once the bellow is off, you can look at the manufacturing date. I don't know how well this is going to show up, but this says 6386. So this was manufactured on March 6th, 1986. And the bellow appears to be in good condition. We're going to measure this later, but this is nice and high up. So that tells me that we still have plenty of gas inside the bellow. Remember earlier I was talking about the fourth wheel and you could snag the minute hand and break the stem on the fourth wheel? That's a very expensive part. You can't buy them new, you can't buy them, you can buy them used, they're around $200. So we're, what we're going to do is you can't use levers when you're pulling these hands off. You have to use this tool and we're going to put pressure on the pivot and gently pull up. Now when we remove the hour hand, we just simply gently bring it straight up. And there we go. Next step, we're going to remove the dial screws. There's four of them, take the dial off. There should be a piece of paper underneath it. And then remove four screws that hold the dial pan to the frame. So this clock was serviced in 93. I was a little surprised to see that the bellow was dated 1986. Usually what you can do is take the serial number of your clock. This clock happens to be 382059. You take that number, you divide it by 20,000 and you add 1954 and that gives you the manufacturing date roughly within two years of the clock. So what's interesting is when I look at the dial, the dial says January 73. So I think they had a failure in the bellow and replaced it with one from 1986 when they serviced it in the 90s. All right, hands are off, the dial is off. Next up is we need to remove the movement from the clock, from the frame. Uh, the barrel probably has some energy left in it. If we take this off without holding the intermediate wheel, we're gonna damage our pallets. So I've already re removed the first screw on the movement, and I'm gonna hold this while I remove this screw. And this is the last screw holding the movement on the clock. And we're going to be very careful not to allow that movement to fall off of the clock. And while holding this, I'm going to go ahead and remove our movement. And we're going to place the movement and our movement holder. Next, we're going to remove the bellow spring. We're gonna remove this spring and we're gonna let the chain rest in here. Remove this pin. Remember, this was the pin that we saw laying on the case in that photograph. So a pro tip, if you go to purchase a clock on eBay and you see nothing but spring up here, 
that means the bellow is no longer functioning. If we can see the chain all around the arbor, that tells me the bellow is working. Unless the seller has removed the bellow and pumped the spring enough times to wind it and then put the bellow back, that is what an unscrupulous buyer will do. Now you wanna count the links. How many links are there left outside of this plate before they install the pin? This one happens to be seven millimeters. Now, if we reference our manual, we should measure, remember there's no, there's no energy left. The, the spring is completely extended. We should measure from the frame to this plate. Let's see, it is supposed to be um, 45 to 48 millimeters. Okay, that's what the, the manual calls for. So I'm gonna measure this with my caliper. I extended it to about 50 something millimeters. I'm gonna hold this straight and just push this and right there it touched and I am at 49.41 millimeters. So what I think I'm going to do when I put everything back together, instead of having seven links visible, I'm gonna have eight links visible. So this is a little bit more compressed. That brings us back into specs. Okay, so next step, remove this spring. That'll be removed from this pin up here while compressing this um, spring and then remove the rest of this and then we'll be able to start taking the frame off of the, the rear frame. I've removed the six screws on the front frame and I've loosened the four screws that hold the frame to the base and of course we've been in the locked position the whole time we've been working on this clock. So now I'm gonna remove the frame from the intermediate wheel and the barrel. This is a little, um, I think someone has added a coat of lacquer to this, so um, it's usually much smoother than this finish. So I do expect that these, the wheel and the barrel might stick just a little bit as I remove everything, but let's, oop, that wheel came out perfect. And we're going to remove the barrel. All right, and there we have it. So next we're going to remove these four screws from the barrel and begin to unwind the spring out of the barrel. Okay, the screws have been removed. Looks like we have a little bit of grease here and we're going to remove the arbor okay I just turned the arbor in the opposite direction and now we're going to remove the main spring Yes, this main spring feels a little sticky. Um, we're going to pay very close attention to the position of the bridle spring. And remember, to, yeah, everything, is, everything is tacky. That's usually the reason these clocks stop running. Yeah, look at this. That grease is just, it's sticky, very sticky. So probably when this clock was last serviced, they used a vegetable-based oil. I don't know if they had access. This is actually a little, yeah, it's sticky. They didn't, I don't know if they had synthetic oil or, or if they used the right oil, but they really over-oiled this thing. Um, we'll find out. We're gonna use Mobius 9020. We're gonna clean this spring off. Um, if there's no rust, so at least I don't have to sand anything down. And we're gonna pay attention to how everything is connected. So this is our bridle spring. This is the main spring. What we're going to do next is pull up on the bridle spring. See how it's hooked in right there? We're gonna push it off like that. And now we can have access to removing the main spring. And there we go. And here we have a nice clean spring. All of these patches is um, 
what came off of the spring and the interior of the barrel. So what I'm gonna do now is change out my gloves and I'm going to take some Mobius 9020 and put it a little bit on my fingers and I'm gonna gently go all the way around the spring and put a thin coat of 9020 on the spring. There we have it. I went about three times up and down the spring. I'm gonna put a little bit on our bridle spring. It doesn't need much. And this is going to be a synthetic oil. It's much better than what was probably installed on this in the 90s. Should give us a longer life expectancy. And I'm not gonna, just very, very little on the interior. And a very nice light coat here as well. That should do it. So what I'm doing here is I started the main spring, caught it on a hook right over here. And I wound it in about almost a quarter of the way. And then I hooked in the bridle spring. And I'm going to try to put the main spring in over the bridle spring here. And then this part of the bridle spring needs to go over the main spring there. Okay, see how the bridle is over where the main spring is attached. And now I am just going to simply wind in the main spring. Being very careful not to kink anything. If nothing has been kinked at this point, it's not going to happen. You just have to be careful. If this was a watch, we would be using a winder. This spring is really loose. Um, some of the barrels that have, uh, some of the springs I've taken out of barrels in earlier models, the main spring was much tighter. So um, I'm hoping this spring still has a lot of life left in it. And I got a fresh pair of gloves. I don't want to get any fingerprints on the spring, leave anything behind. We got a very light coat of oil in here. And there you have it. Next step is going to be put the arbor back in. And well, first let's test the arbor. I'm going to clean it and then we're going to test the arbor before we put it back in. The arbor has been cleaned. All of the old grease was removed. I polished every pivot. These pivots you can polish just using some, um, some naphtha, maybe one dip in a rag and just take your fingernails and have the pads between and just scrape. Clean these off really good, get them all nice and polished. These are shiny. But we're gonna test the arbor to make sure that it's working properly. We should be able to rotate this arbor using this spring without the spring extending. And as you can see, it's working nicely. As you can see, the barrel arbor has been caught in the spring and we are going to oil according to these oiling points and then put the cover back on.
Okay, screws have been installed in the barrel. The barrel's ready to go. I gave it a few tests. We can wind. Okay, ratchet's working. And we can wind. Okay, um, next we're going to take the movement apart. Now is a really good time to just kind of look at the movement, see how everything is put together. Notice the fork looks like it's never been manipulated, so that's good. Um, so we're gonna take this apart. I'm going to get some close-ups of the pivots and the jewels to make sure that nothing is cracked. As far as the jewels go, nothing um, is broken with the pivots. And we're gonna send this through the parts cleaner and use, um, no, no oil will be used in the assembly of any of these gears once we put everything together. The first part to come out was the fork. I just took off the bridge located underneath the movement. And this is a good time to see how freely everything moves. It's not bad. So this tells me, I think the reason the clock wasn't working is the barrel is loaded with grease. It became too sticky. Now, some, some clocks that may be um, overhauled, if the clock worker sees that this moves this easily, he may just send it through a parts washer and not take everything apart and go ahead and reassemble and the clock will probably work fine for uh, a number of years. But the right way to do it is to take everything apart and clean it. I have the movement set up under a video microscope and what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to look at the jewels to see if they are in good condition. They're just a little dirty. I want to make sure nothing is cracked. Let's see, this one's going to have to get... Okay, those look pretty good. Let's look at some more. Okay, this is where the escapement wheel and the fork are in, will be installed. I'm overexposing. It looks like where the escapement wheel was installed is pretty dirty. That's this one right here. Okay, that's a 120 screwdriver. That shows you what our magnification is. Um, now the, the jewel for the escapement is dirty and the jewel for the fork looks pretty clean. So we're gonna definitely send this through a parts washer, make sure everything gets cleaned properly. This is the jewel for the fork. Looks good. Here we can inspect the pallet stones on the fork. We can look at the pivots. That's a nice shiny pivot. Same thing, it has nice rounded ends. Nothing's ever been broken. Last but not least, let's look at the escapement. That pivot looks good. That one looks good also, nothing has been. That's better. Yeah, that pivot looks beautiful. That looks good. All right, everything looks nice and sharp. Nice. All of these parts inside the tray have already been cleaned. I'm not going to handle them again unless I'm wearing gloves. I can handle this though because I haven't put this through the, parts wa the part washer. Now before I begin, what I'm going to do is take a piece of peg wood and go through and polish every, the interior of every single jewel. I'm gonna do this before I put it through the parts washer and then I'm gonna do it again after it comes out of the parts washer. And we're gonna look at it under a microscope to see if everything is nice and clean.
Okay, let's see how we did. This jewel looks really nice. Let's um, check out the rest of them. We're going to begin to overexpose a little bit so we can see, oops, there we go. That one looks really nice too. That one looks terrific. And this one looks really nice too. Let's get that down a little bit. Nice and clean. Okay, this is where the fork will be sitting. And this is gonna be the jewel for the escapement. Nice and clean. And let's go over here. And we're gonna, that one looks really good too. Okay, all the jewels are polished. They're perfectly clean. We are going to begin assembling the movement. Just make sure that when you install your escapement, that you have actually installed the pivot inside of the jewel. It's a very small space. Remember, these aren't um, a large opening like you would have on a watch where the gap gets filled in with oil, although we don't normally oil the escapement pivots on a watch, but just make sure you're there. You can give a little wiggle and it'll feel like you're inside the pivot. Not too much, you don't wanna break the pivot. Nothing has been secured with screws. Everything appears to be in place. You should be able to see the pivot inside of the jewels for the escapement. And we'll flip it over, make sure the other side, we can see the same thing, but this is much, much easier to move than it was prior to cleaning, okay? So what we're gonna do next is snug everything down and install the fork. I have, before I install the fork, I'm going to poise it. So what I have here is I have a stack of cards and I pulled out each card at the same distance that the pivots are on the fork. So right now we're balanced on those pivots. And as you can see, the fork is leaning a little bit in that direction. One thing you can do with this particular fork um, is you can pull gently pull this part of the fork this way to try to get the weight to shift over that way just a little bit. And once you do that and you have everything nice and vertical, you have poised the fork. Okay, that looks a lot better. I'm also looking at it from this side to make sure everything is nice and straight but right now it looks like a perfectly poised fork. And there you have it, the movement is complete. The capstones have been installed over the escapement and on the other side, it's over the um, fork. And let's just see if everything moves nice and smooth. We're actually moving in the opposite direction that this would normally, but it looks great. The balance has remained installed on the rear plate for a couple of hours now. Pretty much the duration of me taking apart everything, cleaning it, reassembling the movement, just so everything can settle down. Now the balance is still just gently moving, but what we're looking at is the center of the impulse roller. See how it's in the middle? Now it's gonna rotate just a little bit to the right, and it's gonna go back to the left, but for the most part, it's staying right in the middle. That's good. If it was off to one side a little bit or the other side, we would loosen that screw and make a correction. If when it's centered like this, this means that the balance is in beat. So when we put our pallet fork on here and it starts to throw the impulse roller to the right or the left, it will move in the same direction to the right or the left. Another thing I'm looking at is the suspension spring is perfectly centered in the balance tube. It's made very hard to see from uh, the camera, but it's pretty much right on the money. So that tells me we really don't have to mess with anything. Hopefully this, the suspension spring is in good shape. Now, tomorrow we're going to check the distance between the regulator pipe and the regulator, regulator setting sleeve. And that is going to be this distance right here, okay? So that has to be between 1.65 millimeters and 1.75 millimeters. If it needs to be adjusted, what we will do is lock the castle nut and move the lever to one direction or the other and then move the lever back to the center. What we're trying to achieve is getting back to factory specs so that when everything is assembled and it's running properly, 
we'd like to see this lever somewhere in the middle. So to ensure that, we have to get this gap in here just perfect. I have a drill bit that is 1.6 millimeters and I have a drill bit that is 1.8 millimeters. So we should easily be able to stick this drill bit inside of this gap. And let's see if we have the correct clearance. No, I'm not able to stick that in there. So we need to make this a little bit larger. I am going to hold the castle nut down with a wood peg rotate the lever to the right, release the castle nut, and bring it back. That should give us a larger gap. Okay, I'm gonna put the peg wood in the castle nut. It's going to stay in place. I'm going to rotate the lever slightly towards the left. That makes the gap larger. And now I'm going to leave the lever in the center. And we're going to check with the 1.6 millimeter drill bit. And it fits in there perfectly. Could probably use a little bit more, although Let's see if we can put the other drill bit in. The other drill bit is 1.8 millimeters. Remember, we should not be any larger than 1.75. And the other drill bit is not going in. So I'm going to go ahead and tighten this screw and call it good. All right, let's check it one more time. Perfect.